to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. For the Lord gives wisdom, from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs chapter 2, verse number 6. Welcome to our study of Living Messages of the Old Testament. Today we study the book of Proverbs, one of the favorite books of many in the Old Testament for its practical, wise advice on daily living, topics that each of us, from love to fear to money to raising children, a host of topics, is discussed in the book of Proverbs and God pulls out gems of wisdom to help each of us make the best choices in life. Key verse in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What's the main principle that, that God is trying to teach through Proverbs? God, in essence, is saying, if you fear me, if you respect me and my authority and want to follow and love me, then you can find wisdom and knowledge through my revelation and through what He has taught us, what God has taught us in the Bible. Now, the key word and the idea, as we suggested, is that of wisdom. But what is wisdom? Wisdom is different from knowledge. Knowledge is the acquiring of the facts, the acquiring of truth. Wisdom is different in that it is not only the acquiring of that knowledge, that truth, but it's taking that truth and putting it in the correct area in one's life. Being able to take knowledge and put it to use in everyday life is the difference between wisdom and knowledge. And so Proverbs is all about helping us during those situations, during the areas of life, know how to apply God's truth to our life. If we were to give a New Testament companion book, it would be the book of James which discusses practical Christian living as well. Let's take for just a moment and examine some various topics in the book of Proverbs and, and see how God applies these truths to everyday life. The first, for example, and one of the main characters we might say in the book of Proverbs is the fool. The fool is in stark contrast to the person God is trying to raise up from studying and learning this book. And so what do we know about the fool from the book of Proverbs? Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15 clearly tells us that the fool trusts only himself. Listen to Proverbs chapter 12 and notice what this verse says in verse 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. What do I know about a, a, a foolish person? He thinks his plans, his idea, and his way is the best way. He heeds his own counsel. Well, contrast that with the person who trusts in God. Proverbs 3 verse 5, the Bible tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. And so the fool's the person who's got everything figured out. He's a big shot. He knows how everything works best. He doesn't need any advice from anybody. Have you ever known anyone like that? Lots of folks think their way is the only way and their way is the best way. But in reality, it's God's truth that will save. When we think about the fool, Proverbs also teaches us that this fool, he's not willing to listen to the advice or criticism of anybody else. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 5, notice what the text tells us. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. And so when we think about this foolish person, not only is his way premier, 
But anybody who tries to help him, criticize him, give him any advice, he's not going to listen at all. Again, this is in contrast to the person who listens, hears, and studies to learn from God. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And so the main application is, and young people especially realize, we don't have it all figured out. There are people who have applied truth a lot longer than I've been applying it, who have learned from mistakes maybe they've made or others have made, and at the very least, I can listen, examine those suggestions or criticisms or ideas according to the Scripture, and no doubt learn and profit from that. A third piece of advice that we learn about the fool is that this man also cannot be disciplined. You, you can't change, you can't correct, you can't really discipline the fool. Notice what the Bible will say about him in Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, Whoever loves instruction loves in knowledge. But now here's the word of the fool. He who hates correction is stupid. This is the fool. He, he hates correction. The one who loves it, he'll grow. But he hates it. He's not willing to listen or be corrected. And if you think you can correct him, boy, have you got another thing coming. And so let's make some application to that. I want to trust God with all my heart. I want to be the person who will listen to God's instruction, which is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. And just as human fathers, sometimes God disciplines His own children. Hebrews 12, verse 9. And I want to be humble enough and willing enough to accept God's discipline or correction so that I'm able to ask myself. I want to examine myself to see if I'm in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and when things occur, I ought to look to my life and say, are there any changes, any corrections that need to be made? Another topic in the book of Proverbs that is discussed at great length is the subject of anger. Anger in and of itself, is not sinful. For in John chapter 2, the Bible teaches us that, that Jesus was angry. He ran those making God's house into a den of thieves out, even made a cord of whips and ran them out with that. And His anger was a righteous anger. And so anger in and of itself is not wrong. But the person who lets anger rule his life and impulse based on anger make decisions that's what's wrong in life. Listen to what some of the book of Proverbs has to say about anger. First, I've got to be the one in control of my anger. Notice Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 29. The Bible says, He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Now, is anger wrong? No. But what is it that I learn about anger? I have to be in control of my anger. When I get angry about something or when something, and rightfully so, makes me angry, I don't want to fly off the handle. I don't want to act based off of emotion or impulse. I need to be slow to anger. What's that mean? Should I not be angry about it? No, it's not what the Bible's teaching. But when I get angry, I still need to be able to reason to think through it and let that anger based on the Word of God motivate us to make right decisions. And so if there's some moral dilemma that say occurs and just say for example that someone is trying to push something that is not correct morally, whether it be abortion, homosexual marriage, uh, euthanasia, whatever it may be, does that make us angry? Sure. But am I going to fly off the handle and go beat up somebody? Well, no, that's not the way it ought to be. Does that mean it still doesn't make me angry? It does. But I take that anger and generate it in the way God wants me to by encouraging, preaching, teaching, rebuking those who are in sin and trying to make a positive outcome as best I can with that. Another lesson that we learn from the book of Proverbs about anger is how you can diffuse an angry person or an angry situation. Is it the case that in this life, I'm going to have to deal with people who don't have control over their anger. Well, you know it is. All of us run into people who are angry, who fly off the handle, who act out of impulse. Does the Bible give any advice 
on how to deal with a person like that? Well, sure it does. Notice Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 1. The Bible says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, let's say that there's somebody who's angry, and that person is angry at you, and he's yelling, and he's venting, and he's just taking it out on you. What's the best way to diffuse that situation? Would it be good for me to bow up and get angry and get up in his face and start hollering back? Well, of course not. A soft answer turns away wrath. It's hard to stay angry and keep venting and ranting at someone who won't do that with you. And so to diffuse anger, that's where a soft answer comes in. Something that is not unkind doesn't mean you don't tell the truth, but you don't have to act a fool like the person who is letting anger rule and control their life. A third piece of wisdom God gives us about anger is very simply this. We need to do our best to avoid angry people. Notice Proverbs chapter 22. Look in verses 24 and 25. The Bible says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go. Why? Lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. And so what does Proverbs teach me for practical living? If there are people I know and you know who are angry people, who always fly off the handle, who get angry at the littlest things, what do I need to do with people like that? Well, the Bible says it's time to sever some friendships and relationships. Those people, the Bible says, don't hang around, avoid them, stay away from them. Well, why, God? lest you learn their ways, lest their bad habits, their anger, their temper, their language, and their impulse decision-making rub off on you. And so as a Christian, I'm to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5 verse 11, rather I'm to expose them and not live my life in view of that. Another topic that the book of Proverbs discusses, which we need to deal with, especially in our day and age today, is the use and abuse of alcohol. Does the book of Proverbs say anything about alcohol and how dangerous it is? It absolutely does. Notice in your Bible, Proverbs chapter 23, and although a rather lengthy passage, I want us to read together verses 29 through 35 and, and get the whole, this is the most graphic description of the drunkard and the pitiful state that he is in. Proverbs 23, I want you to look in verses 29 through 35 with me. The Bible says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. You'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. And listen to this. When shall I awaken that I may seek another drink? Friend, this is such a graphic description of the utter folly and the opposite of wisdom when one uses alcohol. The man's got redness of eyes. He's got wounds without cause. How did all that happen? He lingered long at the wine. He went in search of mixed wine. And the proverb writer says, hey, don't let its initial pleasure or beauty allure you. Oh, it may sparkle and swirl around in the cup smoothly. That is, it may look alluring at first. But be sure, my friend, the Bible says at the last it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. All the alcohol industry has done everything possible to make the allurement of alcohol so appealing to people today. You watch the commercials and every person who drinks beer or alcohol or whiskey, 
They're rich, they're wealthy, they're famous, they've got a fast car and a beautiful wife with them or girlfriend with them and they give that impression, hey, if you'll drink this, you'll be that way as well. A friend, I assure you, it doesn't show the picture of the fellow lying in the street vomiting. It doesn't show the picture of his life that is now in shambles. Wife, family, children have left him because of the alcohol and how it's ruined its life, his life. And so be sure alcohol is destructive to the individual. Now, another passage from the book of Proverbs that, that teaches us that this is not according to the will of God is Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1. Listen to what the proverb writer says about alcohol here. The Bible says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now remember, Proverbs is all about gaining wisdom. I am to pray for wisdom. James 1 verse 5, I am to live a life based off of God's wisdom. And if wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler and the person who follows it is not wise, then friend, you'd be hard pressed to say, that it's something a Christian ought to be involved in. It's the opposite of that. It makes you fight when you don't want to. It makes you do things that are, are repulsive to most people and things that even you naturally wouldn't do. And so be very careful as to what God says concerning alcohol and stay away from it. And as well, my friend, stay away from the drunken crowd. I want you to notice what the Bible says about the crowd. The group of people who are involved with alcohol. Should I be around those people? Sometimes I hear people say, you know, I can go these places and I can go to these parties and I can be around those people. No, not really and be wise. Listen to Proverbs chapter 23, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, For the drunkard, excuse me, verse 20, Do not mix with wine bibbers, or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Here's the person who doesn't have any self-control, whether it be a glutton, whether it be a drunkard, absolutely no boundaries as far as self-control goes. What does God say again? Verse 20 says, do not mix with them. What's that mean? Don't associate with people like that. If you really want to live the wise life, and be the kind of person God wants you to be. You can't associate and mingle with people like that and still stay above the crowd as God wants you to do. You know, another topic that we see in the book of Proverbs that has a great deal of bearing on our society today is the subject of laziness. What does God say in His Word about laziness? Well, we know from passages like 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 following, that it's a sin. Man won't work, neither should he eat. That's found in Scripture. God expects us to be hard workers. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. I am to work unto the Lord, not as unto men. Let's direct our attention now as we think about the subject of laziness in the book of Proverbs. What do we know about the lazy man? Oh, how he loves his sleep. Look in Proverbs chapter 26, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, As a door turns on its hinges, notice this, so does the lazy man on his bed. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl, and it wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. Now, I want you to just stop and think about those illustrations. Just like a door turning on its hinges, moving back and forth, that's the lazy man's profession. What's he good at? Turning over and rolling to the other side in bed. That's about his best achievement in life. He can sure do that good. What's that all about? That's the only thing he excels at, is laying in bed and excelling at sleeping and being lazy. In fact, notice this picture. Now, you imagine this if you can. Let's say out in front, right in front of your place setting, in the table is a beautiful bowl of fried chicken and you're the lazy person and this is the depiction that proverb writer pictures for us you've got the willpower to reach your hand to the bowl but oh you just can't bring it back you're so lazy now do you know anybody that lazy well that's the the graphic illustration used here he excels at rolling back and forth and he's great sleeper 
He's so lazy, though, he can't even take food and put it on in his own mouth. Now, again, that may be a graphic illustration, but how many people in our society today does that describe? Get out and work. Whoa, that's dirty talk right there. That's one of those four-letter words, work is. Now, we can stay home and sit in the easy chair and lay up in bed and let somebody take care of us, but work? Go out and work for my own food and provide for my own mouth? I'd be a lot easier to let somebody else put the food in my mouth in essence. And so there is a lazy society today. And the proverb writer speaks much about that. Another passage in the book of Proverbs is found in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4. And this discusses laziness as well. And what I want you to notice here is there is a direct link between laziness and poverty. Not always, but many times there is. Look in Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 4. The Bible says, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, what's a slack hand? One that won't get out and work. One that's lazy. He who's got a slack or a slow hand, that person's going to come to poverty. You know, my friends, if somebody has a mind to work and somebody has a family to take care of they'll do their best to find work if it means sweeping the floors if it means being a greeter at Walmart whatever it may be you can find work but the problem many times is poverty is a direct result of laziness listen carefully if we raise a society of people who have been spoon-fed by the government and have never been taught to work are we really doing what God says? Or are we enabling them to continue in a path of laziness rather than teaching them to work according to God's pattern? One more passage in the book of Proverbs, and this is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 13. What do we know about the lazy man? One thing he's great at is his tall tales and his entourage of excuses. Look in Proverbs 22, Verse number 13, the scripture says, the lazy man says, there is a lion outside, I shall be slain in the streets. Proverbs 22, 13. Well, is it really the case that there's a lion in the street and that lion is going to attack the man and kill him? Well, of course not. If it were, nobody could go out and do anything that day. And so this is just another pitiful excuse that the lazy man is using so he doesn't have to go and work. I can't find a job or it's too difficult or everybody else is more qualified than me. If you want to work, friend, there's work to be done and thus laziness is a very serious problem. Laziness is really an excuse that we sometimes make just like the man who says there's a lion in the streets. Remember what Jesus said? Luke 14, 18, the Lord said, they all with one accord began to make excuses. And friends, those were worthless, worthless excuses they made then. And thus, we need to make sure that we're not lazy, rather, that we work unto the Lord. Colossians 3, verse 24, that whatever our hands find to do, we do it with all of our might. And so as we study Proverbs, we see what a practical book this is. Friend, Proverbs teaches us that the main idea is the acquisition, the gaining of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We need to be the type of people who pray for wisdom. James chapter 1 verse 5. Who seek that wisdom as found in God's holy word, the source of all wisdom. And then we want to do our best to live according to the teaching and principles of God in salvation. As we think about practical, everyday living, that's really what makes Christians unique. We don't claim Christianity on Sunday only or at a certain time of the day or week only. Christians try to live a level life. That is, we try to live for the Lord every day. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. 
The Bible says in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul speaking to the Romans, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he said, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so may each of us, as we strive to live daily for Christ, study the book of Proverbs, apply its practical wisdom to our life so that we can be a greater light unto the world. Friend, maybe you've never obeyed God's plan of salvation. More than anything, we want to encourage you today to put God's truth into your life by becoming a Christian. Have you heard God's word that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world? John 8, 24, John 14, 6. Are you willing to believe in that? Unless you believe that I'm He, Jesus said, you'll surely die in your sins, John 8, 24. Are you willing, based on that belief, to change your way of life? Acts 3, verse 19, Peter preached, repent, and turn again. Would you make that good confession just like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 verse 37 through 39? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And would you, to have your sins washed away, be immersed in water? Acts 2 verse 38, Acts 22 16. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that today as we strive to live faithfully to Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. He'll return like a thief in the night, and he will reign on high forever with his bride. This is the gospel of Christ, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.